here today is Global Connections Program. I'm Bill Miller. Today, we're going to be taking a look at an international institution that is extremely important, not only in Europe, but in other parts of the world, and that is NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. My guest today is an expert on this organization. Mr. Rolf Schwartz has served as political advisor for the Middle East and Africa at NATO headquarters and as a professor of the NATO Defense College. He currently is senior advisor at the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, commonly called OECD. He's also the author of several articles and books, notably a book on state building and post-conflict peace building, as well as articles on sustainable development and the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals financing. His most recent book is NATO and the Middle East in Search of a Strategy. Mr. Rolf Schwartz, Welcome to today's Global Connections program. Thank you very much, Bill. Thanks for having me. I appreciate you being with me today. Thank you. Uh, before we get into it, let's talk a little bit about NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Just very briefly, uh, when was it formed? Why was it formed? And how many members did it have at the beginning and how many members does it have now? Yes, NATO was formed in 1949 and it was initially uh, formed, of course, as uh, as an answer to to the Warsaw Pact and uh, to to uh, fight uh, in in the Cold War to come up with uh, with that uh, Western unity uh, during the Cold War, uh, a close U.S. Uh, European uh, alliance. Today it has grown um, considerably beyond uh, uh, the initial members. It is now thirty members. It has uh, what one uh, can term reinvented itself. Uh, the organization has uh, taken on global responsibilities in many parts of the world. Uh, and it is uh, today still present in the North Atlantic area, but it is uh, and has the self uh, ambition also to contribute to go towards global peace and security within uh, and under uh, the UN Charter. So it has grown tremendously. It has developed a uh, particular one aspect, which is crucial, which also outlined in the book is that notion of a security community. Um, it's members feeling part of being a community and trying to uh, advance regional security, but also global security. It's a very important organization, and we're going to be talking about why it is and what can be done to strengthen it. But if our viewers are interested, they can go to the website at www.nato.int for more information. Well, let's, if we could, let's dive into your book right now and talk about NATO and the Middle East in search of a strategy. Now, I think you have a copy of the book that you can show. Yes, yes. you do. Very good. <laughs> it why, is it. Why, very good. Why did you write this particular book at this particular point in time? Yes. I've been for, uh, interested in a long time in the in the Middle East region, um, and uh, and NATO as an organization and as an alliance has grown. One particular aspect, which is very interesting for international relations, which is this notion of having developed a security community about its members, and the security community um, uh, is described as having peaceful relation um, among members, uh, uh, shared values. Um, the feeling of belonging to the same community, having a common uh, purpose, sort of uh, being a family. Um, and it is interesting to see that uh, NATO has tried to engage with the Middle East region, which is a neighboring region uh, to NATO, south of it, uh, south of the Mediterranean. And it has employed um, uh, different tools in doing so. Um, um, unfortunately, um, there is still a strategy needed to really embrace this and to really export that community spirit, that security security community spirit uh, to the Middle East. So instead mm -hmm. of focus more on the hard topics of security, it is important to also tackle the root causes of the insecurities in the Middle East. And I think that's what I want to highlight in the book is, yes, a good step has been taken by working with that important world region, the Middle East, but more is needed to make it really meaningful and so that also stability is exported. It's certainly a very vital area of the world, no doubt about that. Now, NATO, as with any organization, be it the United Nations or whatever, has a toolkit and you have soft tools and hard tools. What are a couple of examples 
of uh, a soft tool approach to dealing with a problem, and then maybe some examples of hard tools that you might use. Yes, you're absolutely right. NATO uses a whole tool kit of elements. One of them is partnership. Um, uh, that is the notion of having a political dialogue, of having practical collaboration. Um, uh, NATO, for example, has launched two specific initiatives um, uh, with countries of the region called the Mediterranean Dialogue, bringing together Arab countries, but also Israel. Uh, and then it has another partnership initiative called the Istanbul Cooperation Initiative. Um, the more hard uh, tool uh, tools NATO has at its disposal are crisis management uh, um, and, uh, and and military uh, partnerships. Um, NATO has also uh, employed these um, in Afghanistan, uh, in Libya, military operations. Um, and uh, as I show in the in the book, um, these outside interventions uh, they take place uh, in a context of insecurity, um, and they have often um, um, uh, uh, advanced these insecurities rather than solved them. So often NATO has fought more with the symptoms of the of insecurity in that region rather than really tackling the root causes uh, of insecurity in the Middle East. And so one of the tools which could work better um, is of course that partnership tool, that um, cultural diplomacy, which can advance much more that common feeling uh, also with these partners in, the, in that neighboring region. And you mentioned the root causes, which is extremely important. And of course, in any movement, for example, we see migrants all around the world are moving from one, trying to move from one country to another. And so often we are dealing with the symptoms and not the root causes. What do you, what do you see as some of the root causes of or the challenges in the Middle East that we need to address? One one of the key root causes is uh, is weak and and fragile statehood uh, in many parts of, of the Middle East. Um, and th that means that institutions uh, need to be strengthened. And for example, NATO's partnership, um, if focused more on prevention um, rather than intervention, um, can help strengthen these institutions. Um, in that sense, uh, I use the, the term strategy in search of a strategy also. Um, on the one hand, NATO has embraced the willingness to work with that region but has only half-heartedly done so. Um, uh, more of a push from its members towards that in investing in that region in building these institutions which helped to bring that stability abroad and using less military approaches could be very uh, useful. The second element I think of doing so could be focusing much more on conflict prevention rather than, than in trying to solve uh, or fixing um, conflicts one day, once they have bro broken out already. That's extremely important. It, once the fighting starts, it's very difficult to stop the fighting. It's easy to start a war, very difficult to stop a war. Well, you're watching Global Connections Television, which is a privately funded, independently produced program. The opinions expressed on Global Connections are solely those of the moderator and his guest. We'd invite our viewers to go to our website at www.globalconnectionstelevision.com to view previous programs. Also, if you're involved with a PBS or community access television station, or perhaps an educational institution that has an intra-campus television hookup, or you just have a podcast, or you just have a computer, and you like our shows and you would like to share them, please feel free to do so. Global Connections Television is provided at no cost as a public service to help us better understand international issues and how they impact our lives. Today, we're taking a look at a very important institution, and that is NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. I guess today is an expert on this topic. Mr. Rolf Schwartz has served as political advisor for the Middle East and Africa at NATO headquarters and as a professor of the NATO Defense College. He currently is senior advisor at the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. His most recent book is titled NATO and the Middle East in Search of a Strategy. Before we get back into NATO, I, uh, let's just mention, I don't want to get too far off track here, but the OECD, uh, just very briefly, 
in a minute or so. What exactly is the OECD? So the OECD was founded after the Second World War. It is the organization which was mandated to administer the Marshall, U.S. Marshall aid to Europe. Uh, in a sense, uh, one can say that uh, the OECD is the sister organization to NATO. Uh, in, on the one hand, you have the security aspects of reconstruction and stability. On the other, you have the economic aspects. So OECD is about bringing about that like-mindedness, about economic policies, social policies. It grew out of the Cold War. Today, it has its, its membership is, uh, is, is beyond Europe as well. It has uh, uh, members from all across uh, the globe. But uh, there is a, there's a parallel between the two organizations. Uh, and it's perhaps no coincidence that uh, even in the founding treaty of NATO, econo economic collaboration is mentioned. So in a sense, we see also that economic collaboration and, and, and aligning economic policies is crucial to contributing to not just well-being, but also stability. It's very another very important organization. And our viewers, if they'd like more information, can go to www.oecd.org to get more information on that vital institution. Now, if we can shift back to NATO here, I, I digress a little from time to time on the program, but let's go to NATO in the Middle East. We we see what the horrific situation that's going on right now in Gaza with the, uh, uh, her, the terrible suffering that's going on with the, the Palestinians, with the Israelis. What can NATO, is there a vital role for NATO in helping to bring peace and stability to that area? So my book was written before these events, these terrible events of the 7th October and the ongoing fighting in Gaza occurred. So in a sense, I provide a historical perspective to uh, to it. Um, it is, uh, NATO has always stressed that it has no specific role um, uh, in the Middle East peace uh, uh, process. Um, but um, uh, if you look at the history of NATO, in particular in recent years, NATO secretary generals have stressed that that could change. Uh, and that could change in uh, according to if there are, and the secretary generals have usually referred to this as three ifs. If there is a comprehensive peace agreement, if there is the consent of the parties, and if there is a United, United Nations uh, mandate. Now, of course, today we are far uh, away from these conditions. And at the same time, um, we all know that the time will come once the ongoing fighting will end and a more lasting uh, post-conflict situation needs to be established. Um, and it's perhaps important to mention, uh, Bill, here that already some 15 years ago, the idea of NATO peacekeepers in the West Bank at the time emerged. Um, and while it was then discarded, um, nothing, nothing, in my view, would ex exclude a reflection about conceiving NATO as a peacekeeper uh, in the Middle East. Now, again, I mean, in the book, I historically trace some of these elements. It's not a program for action, but I simply show that over the years and its partnership, NATO has developed excellent relationship with Israel, with neighboring Egypt, with Jordan. Um, and if one looks at a very recent uh, opinion poll, for example, coming out of Israel, is that most Israelis today believe that once the fighting has uh, ended in Gaza, that an international force uh, is needed to uh, monitor and enforce uh, uh, peace. So um, again, as international uh, policymakers will be thinking about the day after, um, I think there is uh, merit in thinking about whether an international peacekeeping force, uh, perhaps composed of some NATO members, uh, could be one of the options which are considered um, as we as as we think about the day after the fighting stops. We really have to start planning for that. Hopefully it's sooner than later. And it's not going to be Indeed. so far down the road, but we really have to start planning for that. This, the situation in the Middle East is very, it's its like a powder keg. It can go off, it has gone off, and it can certainly go off in, in the future, without a doubt. I was curious, as we were talking, when you were talking about being invited, uh, you'd have to have a, a United Nations, I guess, a Security Council mandate to do to get involved or whatever one of the three ifs uh, how do you interact with the united nations you you your goals are running parallel with those 
of UN peacekeeping and UN pe uh, peace building. How do you interface with the United Nations? So U United uh, Nations peacekeeping have taken on different forms. Uh, and there have been often um, uh, also close collaboration between NATO uh, and UN peacekeeping, for example, uh, in Afghanistan, but also in, in Bosnia, in Kosovo. Um, the two organizations have respective strength uh, and weaknesses. Um, uh, there is uh, often it has taken on the, the form of NATO taking on more of the hardcore capabilities for, for UN peacekeeping. Um, uh, there is one uh, NATO spokesperson who once uh, characterized the arrangement as one where NATO is the provider of sort of the taxi company providing the troops where the UN is providing the uh, the political chapeau and the political responsibility. Um, I think what is crucial is um, the United Nations has a lot of legitimacy and it's a global body. Uh, and of course, if, uh, if, if there is the possibility where sort of respective strength can be brought uh, in, I think then it's a it's it's a win-win situation, um, and there have been cases where there have been uh, United Nations peacekeeping missions, but where majority uh, or a large part of the troops contributed uh, come from NATO nations. So that's one of these examples uh, which exist uh, and which I think uh, can help as the international community thinks about um, also solutions uh, to ongoing problems and challenges. Exactly. And now NATO has been very involved in a variety of operations. One that comes to mind is the Balkans back in the mid 90s. What is the current status of the Balkans with Kosovo and Bosnia today and the role of NATO in that area? Yes. So you're absolutely right, Bill. This was one of the historic moments in NATO also when it started embracing sort of uh, projecting stability beyond its borders in the in the 1990s uh, and today NATO is still engaged in the it has a mission in Kosovo um, uh, with, with troops stationed there and with with uh, uh, maintaining stability there the other example you mentioned Bosnia and Herzegovina is an example of actually a shared arrangement similar to the one you mentioned between the United Nations and NATO in this case, uh, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, the arrangement is between NATO and the European Union. Um, so the the peacekeeping and the, the the monitoring is being done by the by the European uh, Union. But of course, when we look at the at the at the region of the Western Balkans, um, NATO has embraced another tool, and it has given the possibility of these members the opportunity also of becoming members uh, of of the alliance. And for example, Croatia. Uh, today is a member of, of, of NATO. So this is another uh, example how NATO, um, uh, you know, to, to link to what, uh, what we said, what we discussed at the beginning uh, of the show, is this exporting of the security community. Uh, and that can happen sort of when others are brought into that community and when they start sharing the same values and when they have set up their institutions in a similar and transparent way so that integration becomes possible. Back before the Russian invasion of Ukraine, NATO, according to the NATO specialists, I'm not one, but according to specialists, NATO was kind of looking to see what its future would be, what was going on, how it could strengthen itself. Some of the NATO members were a little skeptical, maybe, of what NATO could do. But then and Joe Biden, the president of the United States, has gotten tremendous credit for helping to bring NATO together and to provide a solid front in Ukraine. Is that still the situation? Is that going to uh, continue, do you think, even though we've got uh, a very uh, frenzied discussion in the United States right now as to uh, how we should be involved in NATO and other organizations, too? There's it's sort of an isolationist movement in this country right now, which I'll get into in just a moment. But uh, do you see that solid support for uh, of NATO in Ukraine at this point? So currently, NATO allies are, are showing strong uh, support to, to to Ukraine and have made that one of their priorities. Uh, and it, uh, and there's strong commitment that this cont continues uh, as well. Um, in a way, one can say that uh, NATO has sort of um, moved back to a focus of collective defense, uh, a little bit one of the uh, its original purposes. Um, so. Contrary to what I described in the book, which is more the outward perspective, uh, the partnership perspective, 
Um, the engagement of NATO with Ukraine is one where it's really a close neighbor. Ukraine has the ambition of becoming a member of NATO, and that in itself is an issue uh, with Russia. Um, and um, that openness of NATO to continue being open to new members is uh is is the merit actually of the US administration after the end of the Cold War. Um, there is another very influential book which was uh, written about this calling the opening of NATO's doors. This was the reinvention sort of of NATO after the end of the Cold War where former adversaries were allowed uh, to come uh, in and uh, that policy has uh, ma has been maintained. Uh, and as it looks, it will continue uh, to exist, that open door policy. Now, you mentioned uh, President, the, the President Joe Biden and how he has uh, put also the glue in NATO back uh, together um, so that it really holds together as an alliance, that internal uh, cohesion. Um, and one of the key elements there has been uh, burden sharing, um, uh, that all members uh, bring something to the table um, and that that burden sharing can also be uh, uh, comparable. Of course, the United Na States is the biggest uh, NATO ally, but the importance is, I think, and that's where the debate is go going at the moment, is that there needs to be burden sharing and that all members need to step up uh, their commitments in terms of defense spending, but also in terms of support to Ukraine. One of the major challenges we're confronting in the United States right now is just a a plethora of misinformation and disinformation and people who really don't understand history or if they do understand history, they're ignoring it. Uh, for example, just the other day, Donald Trump said that he would withdraw from NATO. We know that's no big secret. He wanted to do that back when he was president. But apparently these people who are aided by operations, media outlets, uh, such as Fox, uh, Newsmax, different ones like that are putting out so much misinformation and disinformation. And they seem to have forgotten that the two major wars, the most horrific wars were fought in Europe and NATO has been a stabilizing force. How would you present that to the American public to let them realize or may help make them realize that NATO is critical to stability and you can't have an isolationist approach. These issues will catch up with us at some point. If Putin takes over Ukraine, it will be detrimental to not only Ukraine, but to Europe and to the United States. But how, how would you make that? And the hardest question in the last uh, 60 seconds we have, how would you make that uh, appeal to the, to the American public and people around the world, really? Very good question. And what I would say, Bill, is security has no borders. So one needs to tackle security comprehensively and one cannot do it as a country alone. You One needs to do this together. The second one is security is not just security, but stability is linked to the economic aspects, to the welfare aspects and to democratic aspects. So NATO brings together all of this. NATO is an institution where there are countries who share the same values with the United States who want to bring forward that comprehensive notion of security, of a free world, free uh, free democracy, um, freedom of markets, uh, but also the opportunity of welfare, of improving the, the economic lives of people. And NATO has been one of these institutions in Europe who have made that possible um, over decades of years and has shown that it held, held this together. So in a sense, it's helping American interests and it can further help American interests. What is needed, of course, I think, is that the organizations adjust, continues to adjust. And if there are adjustments to be needed from the opinion of uh, you know, the American public or uh, American uh, uh, government, uh, then I think the organization is one that has shown willingness uh, to adjust. But I would say in the interest of the United uh, States, to work with like-minded uh, partners, with like-minded uh, allies, actually, who actually advance these same principles which are fundamental to American society, freedom, the rule of law, democracy, and economic freedom. And all of those are under attack right this minute as we speak. That was a perfect way to wrap it up and to make us realize or help us realize 
how important NATO is and how we need peace and stability, not only in Europe, but also in other parts of the world. But Mr. Rolf Schwartz, I want to congratulate you on your recent book. It's an excellent book, and it's very timely, and we encourage everyone to get a copy of it. But I want to thank you so very much for a very interesting and a very informative program. Thank you very much, Bill, for having me on your thank show. You. Thank you. I'm Bill Miller. Thank you for joining us today on Global Connections Television.